Hello and welcome to a lecture on Chapter 4, all about marine sediments in the Essentials of Oceanography book by Alan Trujillo and Herod, Harold Thurman. The, this is a pretty long chapter. Buckle in. You can speed me up on YouTube to get through this a little faster, but these are the main themes we're going to hit uh, in this chapter. Marine sediments contain a treasure trove of information about Earth's history, Earth's climate, almost uninterrupted for about 2 million, 200 million years um, at the bottom of the ocean. All that uh, sediment that uh, accumulates there. Uh, marine sediments also provide a lot of important resources that we use today. And their origins come from a number of different sources, which we'll talk about. So what are marine sediments? Well. Um, most marine sediments are actually just broken up pieces of rock that's on land. Stuff, uh, things that are exposed to the elements that weather away via wind, rivers, glaciers, small pieces of rock that break down and are carried into the ocean, either by the wind, glaciers, or rivers. They can be dust fragments, dirt and debris, and they settle into the ocean floor by suspension settling. So they just kind of, th these small sediments, and they range in size from boulders to tiny uh, flakes of clay, um, and they settle out at different velocities to the bottom of the ocean floor. Larger particles settle out faster, they have faster settling velocities, and they accumulate on the ocean floor. Here's a picture of uh, ocean sediment at the bottom of the ocean floor. And the reason why marine sediment is so important is because it really provides a nice detailed history of our Earth that goes uh, back hundreds of millions of years. Okay, um, we fo often find, or we almost always find, um, fossils of organisms, marine organisms that live in the oceans in the water columns above where the sediment deposits, so we can understand. Uh, organism marine distribution across different parts of the ocean at different different depths in different marine provinces. We can also look at the sediment history and find out when certain organisms appeared in the fossil record. And we can kind of correlate that to different areas of the ocean basin. Ocean uh, marine sediments also track uh, ocean floor movements or tectonic movements. As different sediments are deposited in different marine provinces, and as lithospheric plates kind of move away, they kind of introduce the ocean floor to new environments, and so there'd be a change in sediment, so that can be tracked. Ocean circulation patterns, there are deep ocean currents that occur uh, and uh, move under uh, the surface, also surface currents. When those change, distribution of marine sediments can change, and that can be shown in the sediment record. Even climate change, uh, whenever there's uh, a drastic change in global climate, that can change the sediments being deposited over a certain marine province, and that can be tracked back. And in addition to that, global extinction events will show up in the marine sediment record, and we can track those and compare them, how often they occur, and how these, or why these changes occurred. So marine sediments can be kind of divided up based on their texture, which is the size and shape of the particles. You can have sediment as large as gravel or boulders or cobbles and go all the way down to silt and clay, sand, silt, and clay being the smallest. Okay. Also the shape of particles. Sometimes uh, sediment, um, are very, sediments are very angular, and when they're angular like that, that means they're very close to the source of that sediment, meaning they haven't been worked by a lot of water. Um, sometimes you can have sediment that's very well rounded, meaning that um, it's been pushed around by water and abraded away so that it's nice and rounded. And the origins of these sediments are uh, important, and we can discern that uh, by the different types of sediment. But <clears throat> most sediment uh, comes from worn rocks, dust, broken down pieces that are delivered to the ocean. Uh, some sediment is created by uh, living organisms. They kind of create an ornate shell kind of armor around themselves. Uh, and when they die, that stuff kind of sinks to the bottom of the ocean. Another um, 
less frequent cases. I guess it's very frequent, but in terms of volume of sediment, minerals can directly uh, precipitate out of the ocean water and then deposit on the ocean floor. Um, and then a lot of space dust is delivered to Earth every year. Um, although it makes up a very small amount of total marine sediment, um, a lot of it is just uh, microscopic dust from uh, asteroid collisions or meteor um, uh, meteors as they enter into the atmosphere and kind of are vaporized. And um, that material can kind of slowly settle down into the bottoms of the oceans. And all the sediment there's a possibility that it can lithify into a sedimentary rock, meaning that you can go from, you can go to a beach and just grab a handful of sand. That, if this, if that sand was buried under enough pressure and enough kind of uh, water moved through it and cemented those grains together, it could create a rock. That's what that means. Um, and that's, uh, there are a lot of sedimentary rocks found on the Earth's surface today. And that's the real result of plate tectonics kind of uh, pushing ocean depositional environments to the surface and putting those kind of sedimentary rocks uh, exposed on the surface. Here um, is a nice fancy um, chart to classify different types of marine sediments. We're going to talk about all four, lithogenous, biogenous, hydrogenous, and cosmogenous. Okay, those are the four. Um, and this is nice to reference. We're not going to go through it all, but just to reference what each one of those categories of marine sediments are composed of, where they come from, okay, and their distribution in the different marine provinces, okay. So you can uh, go back and reference this, um, maybe download the PowerPoint, and that'll help you understand the different types of uh, marine sediment. And over time, uh, humans have collected marine sediments in a, d a number of different ways. Uh, the most classic way was just dredging, which means just throwing some sort of mechanism overboard and just grasping the bottom of the ocean floor and grabbing as much sediment as you possibly can. Uh, very crude. Um, it disturbs the sediment. Um, it really is, you can only really find out what's on the surface of the ocean floor. Uh, so not super useful, but later on, uh, our modern exploration, we started to drill cores. And what cores are, are just uh, hollow steel tubes that are pounded into the ocean floor. Okay, so here is a cross section. Okay, it's not the scale, but here are the kind of modern ships, drilling ships, which is pretty crazy. They have thrusters to kind of keep them steady. But then there's this, these steel hollow drill pipes that are all connected together and co can now, to today's technology can get down to um, uh, over seven kilometers. Um, and then uh, they go down into this um, re-entry cone. And then right down here is a rotary drill bit. And that breaks up the rock all around um, the, well, it breaks up the sediment and then all the surrounding hard rock once you get to the hard rock. Um, but it brings up uh, a cylinder tube or a core sample uh, up to the surface and onto the boat where you collect that information. Okay, and that, that has been the kind of major advances in collecting deep sea sediment and also collecting it kind of in the order that it was deposited, which is very useful in understanding uh, things that have occurred in Earth's past. So the, Na the National Science Foundation really started this, this agency started this project in 1963, the uh, Joint Oceanographic Institutions for Deep Earth Sampling. And it included three major schools uh, of, for oceanography. If you're interested in majoring and then doing research or work in anything uh, that has to do with oceanography and earth science, uh, these are great places. Scripps in San Diego, the Residential uh, School of Atmospheric and Oce Oceanographic Studies, that's in Miami, uh, Lamont Doherty at Columbia University, and uh, Woods Hole. Okay, so they developed the uh, that agency the, in partnership with those institutions developed uh, the deep sea drilling project in 1968, uh, and the Glomar Challenger was the drilling ship, and they had over I think it's over 200 different cores in different parts of all the uh, ocean basins, and they found um, 
out a lot of information. In fact, um, <coughs> they confirmed the existence of seafloor spreading. So back when we talked about plate tectonics and the evidence that supported plate tectonics, part of these expeditions helped kind of cement that paradigm shift w with the introduction of plate tectonics theory. So one was um, they were able to drill down through the sediment and get down to the hard rock, and the hard rock is basalt. That's the ocean floor rock. And you can age date that. And so what they found was ocean floor age um, increased as you go away from the mid-ocean ridge. And as you get closer to the mid-ocean ridge and into the rift valley, that's where you find the youngest ocean floor rocks. Um, and so that kind of confirmed that new new ocean crust is being created at mid-ocean ridges, and then it spreads outwards. Uh, in addition to that, uh, sediment tend the thickness of sediment above the hard basaltic rock in the ocean was thicker the further you go away from the mid-ocean ridges, which makes sense because um, if they're older rocks, they've been at the bottom of the ocean for longer, allows for more time for this dusting of uh, microscopic marine sediment to kind of fall on top of that hard rock. Um, and then in addition to that, they found the, the kind of basically the mirror image in terms of magnetic polarity in those basaltic volcanic rocks at the bottom of the ocean on either side of the mid-ocean ridge. And that really is what um, this this was the smoking gun that, that helped uh, support the theory of plate tectonics and seafloor spreading. Okay, later on, the, DS, the, the deep sea drilling project became the Ocean Drilling Project in 1983. Um, uh, Glomar was, the, the ship itself was replaced. Uh, and then it became the Integrated Ocean Drilling Program. Uh, a number of different countries were invited to participate and, um, uh, re, uh, you know, pull up their resources. Um, and the ODP was, the ODP was replaced in 2003. Um, and new ships have been added. The Cheek U is uh, kind of a, a newer vessel built in 2007 with the most uh, updated technology, can drill the farthest. In fact, it went to the Japan Trench after the Tohoku earthquake in 2011. Um, so this is an ongoing, this is where the real ocean uh, science is. This is like the frontier of uh, new research are from these um, drilling programs. And the science that or uses marine uh, sediments to kind of understand how the ocean or atmosphere um, and land interactions have changed the ocean chemistry or any ocean circulation or any organisms or climate associated with that is paleo-oceanography. And here's an example of what a core looks like when you bring it to the surface, okay? Now, it's... The, it's, they're cylindrical shaped, okay? So the cores come out like this, okay? I'm a terrible, <laughs> that's a cylinder. Um, but they're cut in half, and so this is uh, one that's cut in half. And then you can see here, um, what's on top would be the youngest sediment, okay? So just imagine this is the ocean floor surface, and new sediment kind of suspension settles from the water onto the surface of the ocean floor here. So these are the youngest sediments. And so then you can assume down here are the oldest sediments. So this represents um, an interval in time in Earth's history where sediment has been accumulating in this particular area wherever you drilled for it. And so the reason why marine sediments are important is because you can clearly see, do you see these changes? You can see changes in texture, color. Um, if you looked in more detail, I'm sure you'd find differences in marine organisms, microfossils that you'd find. Um, so perhaps uh, right here, this um, material here looks a little coarser, more gra filled with gravel. Perhaps sea level fell and the environment changed and uh, now this was closer to uh, the continents. So larger particles of sediment began to deposit here uh, much more recent times or something. Okay, and then here, this looks like more clay, perhaps more biogenous sediment. Uh, organic in origin, so there might be siliceous or calcareous oozes found here. Who knows? And then maybe here you'll find a layer where there's a lot of uh, very fine volcanic ash or something like that, um, and that would mark uh, a volcanic eruption in the nearby area, okay? Or you'll find some cosmogenous sediment that have uh, extra, extraterrestrial in origin. It might 
record a, a global extinction event. So these are the reasons why marine sediment is important because it kind of provides an uninterrupted uh, history of our Earth uh, as recorded by sediment in the oceans. And here's a, an example of two scientists working with cores that were just pu pulled up on a ship. And you can see here, this is the cylindrical shape of them. Okay, these are the cores pulled up. Uh, they're all numbered, um, different intervals, top to bottom, so we get a good idea of what occurred first, what occurred afterwards, and then we just put specific time markers for certain events on them. All right, so uh, the way we classify marine sediment is based on these four uh, types, which are classified based on their origin. Lithogenous sediments, by far the most abundant. Um, that's derived from land, rocks on land kind of uh, weathering away and being delivered to the oceans. Biogenous sediment, I guess come from the name bio or biology, that's sediment that's derived from organisms. Okay, Hydrogenous sediment or orthogenic sediment, this is derived directly from sediment precipitating out into the water. Okay, so that has to deal with chemistry. Uh, certain um, uh, dissolved solids may increase in concentration high enough to the point where they start precipitating out of the water and uh, deposit on the ocean floor. And then cosmogenous, those are sediments that are derived from outer space. Okay, so let's go over lithogenous sediments. These are just eroded rock fragments from land. They're also called terrigenous because Tierra is kind of like you know, the Latin root word for earth, okay? Um, uh, the, the different types of terrigenous sediment really reflect the composition of the rocks that are eroding on land. So say you have a rock here. Um, over time, you get fractures and joints because of differences in pressure. Um, there's a, a weathering that occurs, and then these rocks start fracturing into smaller and smaller pieces, and that stuff eventually can uh, be moved out into the ocean. Okay, so rocks tend to break down into smaller and smaller pieces. And then they, under the force of gravity, wind, or even water, they kind of help travel down to the oceans. So these small particles erode and then are transported. They're carried to the ocean from streams, wind, glaciers, and gravity. Um, so the greatest quantity of lithogenous sediments are around continental margins, which makes sense because continental margins uh, are areas that are next to the continent. And if you have sediment that's derived from rocks from the continent, of course, the greatest quantity would be closest to those continents. So here's some cool examples. Um, this is the uh, Po River in northern Italy. You can see the river dumps out into uh, the Mediterranean Sea here. Uh, and you see this plume of very light sediment kind of changing the color of the of the water. That's all sediment that's in suspension being delivered into the ocean. Eventually, it'll settle and deposit out on the bottom of the ocean floor. Glaciers, um, they do a lot of work, actually. Um, they grind the rock kind of underneath the glacier here, and then that kind of pushes a big like bulldozes a big uh, um, amount of sediment directly into uh, lakes or into the ocean. But also there's here these moraines in the middle of a glacier that are covered by sediment. And a lot of sediment gets kind of piggybacked on top of the glacier, then delivered to the ocean. Or there's sediment that's inside the glacier, inside the ice. And as the icebergs kind of break off and calve into the ocean, they slowly melt and then they drop their sediment load. Okay, and if you've been to every, anywhere that's uh, really dry where there are deserts, you can often get sandstorms like this. And um, uh, wind can pick up really small particles and then, wa and then blow that right over into the ocean. And then in places like California, um, you can have uh, cliffs by the ocean and then you just get uh, gravity pulling down uh, on this material as it uh, kind of mass wastes uh, close to the ocean, uh, ocean floor and then it can fall into those breaking waves. So that's how they get transported. So the composition of lithogenous sediment reflect the rocks that are close by. Um, coarser sediment is closer to shore, meaning that like uh, they're closer to their source. They haven't been worked by water and smoothed out. Finer sediment uh, is typically fi found further away from shore, and that's because 
Um, coarser sediment is heavier, has a faster sailing velocity, so they'll deposit out really quickly. Fine sediment will remain in suspension uh, in the water for longer because their settling velocities are much slower. Okay, And uh, one of the most resilient minerals in rocks is quartz. They're resilient to weathering, so uh, a lot of lithogenous sediment, um, its composition is actually quartz, SiO2, which is pictured here. Here's an example of uh, lithogenous uh, um, dust from the Saharan Desert being tr delivered to the uh, Atlantic Ocean uh, via the global wind belts. Okay, so here is the Saharan Desert. Okay, uh, we have the the trade winds that uh, are persistent winds that blow over uh, the African continent, and it blows a lot of Saharan dust into the Atlantic Ocean. So we a lot, see a lot of lithogenous, uh, very fine sediment being blown up and taken into the uh, into the atmosphere and deposit out into the Atlantic Ocean. Sometimes these plumes make it all the way to the Caribbean and even into Florida. Um, that can cause uh, kind of uh, allergic reactions. To some people might have adverse reactions to that. It also makes the sunsets and sunrises a little pinker and hazier. Okay, here's the Wentworth scale of grain size. I've talked about this. Um, this is how we classify different sizes of sediment, okay? Largest being boulder, okay? Smallest being clay. So whenever I ever say small clay, clay and silt are the smallest, then there's sand, granules, and pebbles. Here's the size range in terms of millimeters, okay? So sand would be anywhere between 1 16th to 2 millimeters in size. All right, so just to get an idea. Um, anything uh, that's larger is considered coarse grained, and anything that's small, like silt or clay, is what, is what we call fine grained. So beach sand is typically sand sized stuff, um, microscopic, soft feeling, sticky feeling, kind of muddy stuff would be more like clay. Okay, and then uh, the size of the um, sediment uh, indicates the um, depositional environment in which it was. Uh, deposited. So um, larger grained sediment typically are deposited in high energy environments. Think of like where the waves crash on the beach. That's typically where you find your largest pieces of sediment that are piled up because they're, you know, because they're kind of uh, high energy waves crashing down and that kind of picks up heavier uh, sediment or larger sediment. Uh, lower energy environments, let's think of like a lagoon or something like that. Those are really low energy. Then you'll find a lot of um, that allows for the really small particles to settle out and deposit. So bays and muddy areas, lagoons and stuff like that are considered low energy. So the texture of the sediment that you find can indicate the environmental energy, high energy, strong wave action, larger particles. If you have a low energy environment, that means smaller particles. And typically, larger particles are closer to shore, and that's because they deposit out quicker because they're heavier. Sorting is a, dis, uh, a way of describing um, the grain size uniformity, meaning that like if you have a bunch of marine sediments um, that are all the exact same size, that means that that is well sorted. Um, if you have a lot of marine sediment that consists of boulders, gravel, clay, sand, and a bunch of different sediments of different sizes, we would consider that poorly sorted. Okay, and that's indicative of uh, the type of environment it can come from. Typically, well-sorted um, deposits, something like uh, wind, deposit, wind deposits, because wind can only pick up a certain size sediment, clay, silt, and maybe the finest sand, right? So wherever that deposits out from the wind, that depositional area is going to have well-sorted sediment because wind can only carry small particles. So all of those will have grain size uniformity. Okay, if you have a major landslide or uh, uh, a massive turbidity current, which is an underwater line, landslide, you're going to have poorly sorted sediment as a result because those were kind of high energy, uh, kind of pick up all the different size sediment and deposit them all together. So how is sediment distribu distributed? Um, there are two major environments, the neuritic environment, which uh, translates to uh, shallow water deposits very close to land. Um, neuritic environments, um, most sediment found here is lithogenous, and that makes sense because they're close to land. 
Um, and these sediments typically deposit quickly, uh, delivered from rivers or, so, or uh, some other source directly into the water, and they deposit out very quickly. Pelagic sediments, this really refers to deep water deposits, way beyond the continental margins, like beyond the slope and the rise into the abyssal plain. That's what we're talking about when we talk about pelagic sediments. They're typically finer grain sediments, and they deposit really slowly. In fact, um, something like clays and silts can take as much as 50 years to deposit out into the deep ocean before they make it to the bottom of the ocean. And that's a combination of uh, the, the deep waters of the ocean. It's, it's very deep. It has to traverse, on average, uh, about three and a half miles. Uh, but their settling, settling velocities are so slow, so that's why it takes so long. Okay, so let's talk about some of the neuritic lithogenous sediments. We have deep beach deposits. These are the ones that you're probably most familiar with. These are wave deposited, uh, usually quartz-rich sands. Quartz, quartz is kind of colorless or even white, so that's where you get those kind of white sand beaches from. Um, continental shelf deposits. These are uh, deposits in um, kind of uh, deeper deposits than beach deposits out on the continental shelf. And that's mainly uh, finer stuff in comparison to the beach deposits, but still kind of larger lithogenous material uh, than you'd see on the pelagic environments. Um, sea level fluctuates, goes higher and lower. Uh, during our last glacial period, um, our last glacial maximum was about 18,000 years ago, but um, uh, pretty much the, co the cooler times ended about 10,000 years ago. And when Earth is much cooler, there's a lot more water uh, in the form of glaciers, continental glaciers on land, so that lowers sea level. So a lot of our continental shelf uh, during our last glacial maximum um, was exposed. Uh, and so a lot of the, the rivers that empty out into the sea today actually uh, deposit a lot of sediment on these continental shelves. And that sediment we refer to as uh, relic sediment because there are se sediment that was deposited there as a, as a relic of the last cooler time period in Earth's history. There in, then there are um, turbidite deposits. These are underwater landslides that occur um, along the continental slope. Um, these are kind of uh, muddy mixed waters that move quickly downhill under the force of gravity that carry a lot of different sized particles, and they leave uh, graded bedding deposits. Okay, Then there are glacial deposits, and we see these uh, really in high latitude areas that are close to the ocean and on the continental shelf. And um, a lot of the sediment kind of can get bulldozed from glaciers that kind of calve off into bays and into oceans, but a lot of times they calve off giant chunks of uh, of ice into the water and they get swept up by ocean currents. But within those big chunks of ice, those icebergs, they have a lot of trapped sediment. And so um, that those icebergs, all right, this is our iceberg, has a lot of trapped sediment in it. And as, as the iceberg melts, then the uh, sediment will be dropped from those icebergs. We call that ice rafting. In pelagic settings, way on the deep ocean, we typically find very fine grain uh, marine sediment. Okay, It accumulates very slowly in the deep ocean. Um, the sedimentation rates or accumulation rates of marine sediment can be um, millimeters per thousand years. Uh, so it's very slow. And so a lot of the source of this pelagic fine grain material is uh, volcanic ash from eruptions, wind-blown dust like from the Saharan Desert like we talked about, or just really fine grain material that was delivered to the ocean and just slowly um, uh, settling out. All right, and so in those areas of the deep ocean, uh, most of that sediment we refer to as abyssal clay, okay? Um, because it's uh, the definition is that it's at least 70% clay sized particles from the continents. And a lot of times abyssal clays, uh, they're called red clays, and the reason is, is because they, they often have a, a lot of oxidized iron in it, and that gives them that kind of red color. Okay. 
Um, now let's move on to biogenous sediment. Biogenous sediment is made up of hard remains of once living organisms. And there's two major types. There's macroscopic and microscopic. Macroscopic is something that you can see with the naked eye. You can just uh, w say you're walking on a beach and you see some shells, bones, or any teeth. That are Those are remains of organisms that were living. Like, uh, you, uh, like if you go to Lido Key, uh, which is off the, uh, it's on a barrier island near Sarasota, it's chock full of macroscopic uh, biogenous sediment, all washed up by the waves. Okay, uh, but that doesn't make up um, um, a lot of the biogenous sediment. Those those environments are actually quite uh, small in comparison to the deep ocean. In the deep ocean. Um, there's a lot of microscopic life that floats around the sunlit layers in the deep ocean. And those organisms, they create really tiny shells, and we call them tests or shells. And the, when they die, they may live a couple days or a week. When they die, those shells kind of rain down to the bottom of the ocean floor, and they start creating a type of sediment called bio, biogenic ooze. Okay, the reason why it's called an ooze is because it's, um, think of like, say you have toothpaste and you squeeze some of it out and you mix it with water and then you just kind of mix it in. It's kind of very soft, kind of um, water mixed material with very like uh, clay type soft material. So the reason why it's because so just imagine if you were to step on it, all that biogenic ooze would be able to kind of mush its way around your toes, um, kind of like very soft mud almost. And this stuff is made up mainly by algae and uh, protozoans floating around on the ocean surface. So the, the two most common chemical compounds that make up biogenous sediment are calcium carbonate, okay? Um, what kind of like the material that uh, uh, a lot of shells are made of that you see washed up on the beach or coral, um, and then silica, okay? Uh, those are the two most common types of biogenous sediment, or they're the composition of biogenous sediment. So let's talk about the silica first. Um, this is mainly made up by these two different types of organisms, diatoms and radiolarians. Diatoms are single-celled uh, eukaryotic planktonic photosynthetic algae, <laughs> um, and they float around the surface of the ocean uh, and they photosynthesize, so that's how they generate their food. This here, uh, this image here, and this image here are diatoms, and they generally uh, create these shells out of silica. You can see they're very, um, um, very beautiful and or ornate. Uh, a lot of times diatoms, uh, or mo almost all the time, they have, um, you can kind of, uh, it's almost like a, like a shoe box where there's a top and a bottom and they close together. So they have two kind of symmetrical sides. Um, and the organism is a single celled algae that lives inside this. These little holes that you see here are holes in the silica to allow nutrients in and waste to come out. And since they photosynthesize, that waste is oxygen, okay? So, oh, down here, this is also, um, uh, a diatom as well, almost like a canoe-shaped diatom down here, and this one's going more round. Um, there are over like 7,000 different species of diatoms, so uh, incredibly diverse, um, numerous uh, in the ocean. It's almost like they're the kind of grass of the ocean. They're small uh, organisms that are just all over the place photosynthesizing in the sunlit layers of the upper ocean. Okay. Um, and then there are radiolarians. Radiolarians are protozoans. Um, some, uh, most are planktonic, so they float around in the ocean. Um, but they use an external food source. They have to kind of bump into other uh, planktonic organisms to eat them. Okay, this right here is a radiolarian. Um, uh, sometimes they're referred to as the snowflakes of the of the ocean because of their uh, beautiful and ornate uh, uh, creations. Okay, so again, single-celled organism, um, and they often have uh, kind of these spines that shoot out of them, um, and that's to help them uh, float because they're planktonic. 
Okay. Very beautiful. They they all they make their all these tests or shells out of silica, and when that uh, silica is when these organisms live and then they die, their shells rain down to the bottom of the ocean floor, and that creates something called diatomaceous earth. Okay, it's kind of like this white powdery um, material that we actually use in a lot of different uh, household products all the time. Um, so those are the tests. These are the shells of microscopic organisms. This is what uh, broken down ocean sediment would look like under a microscope. If you have a lot of bio biogenous sediment in it, you can see uh, some of the shells of, of, radi of um, diatoms, broken pieces of radiolarian all over the place. And that's what makes up siliceous ooze. So it's an, a biogenic ooze that's mainly composed of silica. Okay. Now, if siliceous ooze, um, in terms of sediment, it's defined as having at least 30% ooze that comes from silica. The rest is typically very fine lithogenous sediment like clay, but it's still considered an, an ooze. Oh, so here's another radiolarian. Um, uh, we actually, one of our oceanography classes took this image using a scanning electron microscope. So diatomaceous earth, like I mentioned, has a lot of uh, uses. Um, we use it uh, as a uh, water filter. We use it in the production of, of beer, yay, bread, um, cleaning solutions, fillers, and tires. Uh, and kind of uh, oddly enough, we use it uh, sometimes as an abrasive. Uh, it's put in toothpaste. So when you brush your teeth, the silica, silica is a very strong mineral, so it could polish your teeth. So that's why. Um, we use it in that fashion. So perhaps this morning you brushed your teeth. Little did you know you had these, uh, the dead m remains of microscopic marine organisms, just their bodies used to scrub clean uh, the teeth in your, in your mouth, really. Okay, then there are uh, the calcareous oozes or the calcium carbonate biogenic sediment. Okay, these are organisms are much smaller than diatoms. These are coccolithophores, and what they do is they create these plates, and they surround themselves by these plates, which eventually make a circle. Um, but they also, these are uh, photosynthetic algae as well, so they, they photosynthesize as well. They're just much smaller. A lot of times they're called nanoplankton because they're much smaller than diatoms. Um, by the way, diatoms are found almost in every environment. They're found in like ocean sediment, you know, they're found floating uh, in the surface uh, uh, of the ocean kind of by themselves or in communities. They also live on the skin of uh, sea turtles and also whales. So you find these organisms all over the place. So when, when uh, coccoliths die, then the, uh, their tests, which are made up of something different, calcium carbonate, also sink to the bottom of the ocean. Um, and if enough of this accumulates to form calcareous oozes, and if that lithifies to form a rock, that's where we get rock chalk from, okay? These are the white cliffs of Dover. This is an entire cliff made up of chalk. Like, so you could go over here and chisel out a piece of chalk and then just start writing on a blackboard. And that's pretty crazy. Think about that, right? So this material, which we use often when we teach in person, and we'll get back to that, but you're essentially just smearing the lithified remains of dead marine organisms as you're trying to explain some sort of complex calculus uh, theory or physics problem, uh, which is kind of intense. All right, so here's the best example of this are the White Cliffs of Dover. Um, uh, there are a lot of the, this... Uh, this, these white cliffs age to the Cretaceous time. In fact, there are a lot of different chalk deposits around the world on land uh, that date back to the Cretaceous. And Cretaceous uh, is kind of a, uh, it's named the Cretaceous because there are a lot of chalk deposits as a result. Uh, foraminifera, another type of organism, uh, protozoan that also needs an external food supply. Uh, they also uh, become part of the calcareous ooze when they die and become part of ocean sediment. These are much larger than coccoliths. Um, a lot of times they're um, uh, buried in the sediment. Sometimes they can float around in the water, just depending. There's a lot of different species. Um, but yeah, they're made up of 
uh, calcium carbonate. Okay, so the distribution of biogenous sediment really depends on um, three things. The productivity, meaning the number of organisms in the surface of the water above the ocean floor. So if you have a big bloom of these organisms and they're being very productive and reproducing and there's a lot of them, that means that you'll probably find a lot of biogenous sediment uh, directly beneath them. Um, another factor is destruction, meaning that uh, those skeletal remains or tests, they can dissolve in seawater, especially at different depths um, under different conditions. So if they're all dissolving away, then they won't deposit and you lose that material. And the final factor is dilution. Because uh, in reality, most marine sediment is lithogenous sediment. So if you're in an environment that's very close to land, there are uh, microscopic marine organisms that live in the surface waters there. But because so much lithogenous sediment is being delivered to the ocean in that area, it dilutes the amount of biogenous sediment. So you, you'll find biogenous sediment in neuritic environments, but um, it won't ever be classified as a biogenic ooze just because there's so much more lithogenous sediment. So that's what dilution really is. Okay, so let's talk about siliceous oozes. They accumulate in areas where there is really high productivity, meaning that these organisms are proliferating, ubiquitous all over uh, the surface of the water. So silica tests do dissolve in ocean water, um, but they do not dissolve if enough is being produced and burying the ones that hit the bottom of the ocean. So let me show you an image of what that looks like. Okay, so say we have an area of low productivity. Uh, not too many organisms are living and dying that create those shells, so very few tests are sinking. And because very few of them are sinking, sinking they're all dissolving either before or when they get to the ocean floor. Okay, but if you have an area of really high productivity, then that means um, so many shells are coming down and depositing uh, out so quickly that there isn't enough time for them to dissolve away. So a lot of these sil siliceous um, tests are preserved essentially by uh, burying more and more um, uh, silica tests above it. And this is how you would get a siliceous ooze deposit. So they really occur in areas of really high productivity. Okay. Now, neuritic deposits are, like I said, dominated by terrigenous or lithogenous sediment. They can get contain biogenous sediment, but again, it's, it's the di dilution thing. You don't really find, or you can't find them in really high concentrations because there's just so, many lith so much lithogenous sediment. Um, carbonate deposits are, are deposits that have a lot of CO3. Okay, carbonate, minerals that contain uh, that in it. Marine carbonates are primarily limestone, which is calcium carbonate, CaCO3. Um, most limestones contain the remains of living organisms. Uh, you can find like coral or other bivalves or shells. Um, and so that really suggests uh, a biogenous in, or in, in origin. And so a lot of the ancient marine carbonates make up about 25% of all sedimentary rocks on Earth. We have a lot. In fact, um, uh, the top of Mount Everest, well, the rocks that you walk on as you're at the highest point on Earth are limestones. Those have an origin uh, in the ocean, in shallow oceans. Um, there's huge deposits of limestone. I mean, <laughs> Florida, the entire state of Florida, our bedrock is all limestone. Uh, parts of Kentucky are kind of like that. Places in Central America have a lot of limestone, like the Yucatan. So there are a lot of places that have limestone uh, as, as their bedrock, and that's uh, kind of derived from ocean environments. Stromatolites are, are an organism that is a type of carbonate deposit. Um, Stromatolites, uh, they still exist today in Sharks Bay, Australia, uh, but they lived billions of years ago. Some of the oldest uh, evidence of life we have on Earth are from stromatolites. And, and the way they live is they kind of create this bacterial mat um, and it accumulates sediment and then they just kind of build on top of it. So there's these concentric layers of a colony of bacteria, photosynthetic bacteria that just kind of grow one on top of, uh, of each other. And so you can see the fine layer of uh, carbonate, the 
different kind of almost like growth rings in a tree. Okay, stromatolites are a type of cyanobacteria, and they kind of this only forms in very warm, shallow seas of high salinity. Okay, and they still they're still around in Shark Bay. You can see modern stromatolites. They existed 3.5 billion years ago, and they were really the first evidence of photosynthetic life on Earth. And, uh, a lot of times they're uh, attributed to oxygenating our atmosphere, so they're really important that long ago. But um, a lot of carbonate material, especially out in the open ocean, deeper parts of the ocean, dissolves away. Um, the calcareous ooze uh, only forms in kind of shallow portions of the ocean floor. And the reason is because calcium carbonate ready, readily dissolves, especially uh, when the temperature drops um, and ocean acidity increases. Those are kind of the, the two factors that are most important. Calcium carbonate is a very strange um, uh, material because it, 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 it precipitates out in warmer waters. So like, I don't know if you've taken a warm shower, but a lot of times you see like this white crusty stuff form on your shower head. That's calcium carbonate because you're taking a hot shower that kind of uh, precipitates directly out of the water, uh, our Florida water, because it has a lot of calcium in it. So it'll precipitate directly out of the water onto your shower head. Um, so yeah, so we see this in the ocean. But in the ocean, especially in the deep ocean, see this area down here? Um, it's very cold. So when it gets very cold and when there's a lot of um, uh, carbon dioxide uh, in, in the water itself, that raises the um, uh, acidity of the water and then helps dissolve away uh, a lot of the calcium carbonate. Okay, so, so what happens is there's a depth where calcium carbonate readily completely dissolves. And we call that the CCD, the calcite compensation depth. So here the rate of supply equals the rate at which the shells dissolve, and then no, none of this material will deposit on the ocean floor. So really a lot of calcareous oozes will form in uh, more shallow areas of the ocean. Okay, When you have cool, deep ocean that's saturated in calcium carbonate, then you'll have a CCD. So this dashed line here is the, carb the calcite compensation depth. So if you have any organisms that live on the surface of the ocean here, their, material, their tests and shells will rain down, and then as they hit this limit, which is typically on average four uh, and a half kilometers beneath the ocean surface, they'll readily dissolve away, and you won't find any calcareous oozes uh, beyond this depth. Um, but there are places of the ocean floor that are at a higher quote-unquote elevation, let's say, um, and they're above the CCD. And so they'll deposit in these kind of um, areas that are at higher elevations or peaks. And so essentially it's kind of like, it's, it's like marine snow. So you can think of calcium carbonate from these microscopic organisms falling down and depositing in high areas of the ocean floor above the CCD, okay? And the reason why that's below the CCD, the water um, because it's at higher pressure, can hold more dissolved carbon dioxide. And if it holds more car carbon dioxide, that creates more carbonic acid, which makes the water more acidic, and that's why calcium carbonate dissolves faster beyond the CCD. So um, you really find, you don't find any calcareous oozes depositing beyond uh, about five kilometers, okay, in our modern ocean. Um, ancient calcareous oozes uh, may have de uh, um, deposited at greater depths depending on uh, different situations in ocean chemistry. Also, uh, by plate tectonic situations like uh, seafloor spreading. Let me show you an example of that. So <clears throat> the mid-ocean ridge, okay, this is where we have active volcanism and new ocean plates being created. Um, this is at a higher elevation than the average ocean floor. And the reason is, is because it's hot and it's more buoyant. You have new ocean crust rising up and you have volcanic eruptions right at the center of the mid-ocean ridge. So on the ocean surface, biogenous sediment is being produced and it's raining down on the ocean floor. But over here, all that biogenous sediment is depositing um, below the CCD, so it just dissolves away. 
over the mid-ocean ridge area, which is like here, this entire environment is above the CCD. So what you'll find is, see this blue kind of wedge here? That blue wedge is calcium, uh, calcareous ooze depositing on the mid-ocean ridge. But over time, as the two plates diverge from each other uh, and they move away from the mid-ocean ridge, um, the plate kind of moves downwards into deeper waters. But what happens is so much abyssal clay has been depositing on top of the calcareous ooze that the calcareous ooze actually gets preserved underneath the abyssal clay. And despite the fact that it's below the CCD, it has a protective layer above it so it doesn't dissolve away. Okay, so that's a, a, a way that seafloor spreading uh, can affect sediment accumulation. So here's the, the, the modern distribution of calcium carbonate sediments uh, in our oceans. If you notice, they kind of um, are depositing in the more shallow areas of the deep ocean, closer to mid-ocean ridges. You see how, see how they're kind of all over the mid-ocean ridges? And that's because typically those areas are above the CCD. All right, and then here are uh, an, an, another example of uh, cross-section of marine sediment. So perhaps, you know, um, in the changes that you see here in coloration might be changes uh, of um, as the ocean floor is moving away from the mid-ocean ridge, then you get deposits of, of uh, abyssal clay above what would be biogenous ooze and that that would be preserved. So that's what can account for these major changes in marine sediment over time. All right, let's talk about hydrogenous marine sediments. These are ones that precipitate directly from seawater, okay? And there are many types. Think of, th what I mean by this is think of like, say you have water, right? And you add a bunch of sugar to it, okay? Um, and then you heat up that sugar. That sugar will crystallize eventually if the temperature goes up high enough and there's a little bit of evaporation, the sugar will saturate in the water and then begin to precipitate out. That's what um, hydrogenous marine sediments are. Different materials dissolved in ocean water that precipitate out and then deposit on the ocean floor. There are uh, many examples. There are manganese nodules, phosphates, carbonates, and metal sulfides. Okay, they make a really small portion of the total marine sediment and they're distributed in a very diverse types of marine provinces. Okay, let's talk about manganese nodules first because they're really the most interesting. They're, they're almost like golf ball sized um, pieces of uh, m mainly of metal, mainly mangan manganese. So what's that doing at the bottom of the ocean? <laughs> it's crazy. Um, the, they have a lot of iron in them, other metals, copper. Um, they grow very slowly. Their accumulation rates are very slow. Um, and they have a lot of potential commercial uses. So people have thought of mining these nodules that are found on the surface of the deep ocean, which is very weird. Um, scientists still are unsure um, exactly how they form. They know that if you cut them open, you typically find um, like a shark tooth or a piece of fish bone or perhaps um, a lithogenous sediment and the metal grows around it. They think there's some sort of bacteria that slowly accumulates the manganese surrounding some sort of nucleation um, piece. Uh, but th they're really unsure why they're not, they take so long to grow, why they're not buried uh, underneath all the other uh, um, pelagic sediment out in the deep ocean. So something is kind of keeping it up on the surface. So if you look, here's an image at the bottom of the ocean floor. You see all these manganese nodules just littered everywhere. And the density of them on the ocean floor varies on location. Some of them, you have really dense areas. Um, and some, uh, I guess, a little more sparse. But uh, here's a cross section of one about a baseball size uh, manganese nodule. Okay. Phosphates, these are phosphorus bearing deposits. Uh, they typically occur in areas where there's a lot of biological productivity, okay? Meaning that like there's a lot of ocean life, uh, maybe the site of upwelling where nutrients went up to the surface, you get algal blooms that brings in small fish and 
uh, uh, birds and then whales and stuff like that. So an area with a lot of biological productivity, a lot of organisms dying, and that material kind of sinks to the bottom uh, of the ocean floor there. And these uh, these deposits are very important because we use them as fertilizer. Um, we actually have some uh, a lot of phosphate deposits near the, the Tampa area here in Florida. Um, and then there are carbonates. Uh, aragonite and calcite are the different types of uh, carbonate deposits. Um, oolites are a type of carbonate that forms in very um, warm waters. It's calcium carbonate just precipitating out of um, small circular nodules that roll around in the uh, kind of uh, waves in tropical areas. Um, then there are metal sulfides. Metal sulfides are made up of iron, nickel, copper, zinc, silver, other precious metals, and they form from hydrothermal vents. So remember we talked about black smokers. That shoots out incredibly hot water that's mineral rich uh, at really high temperatures, 350 degrees. And as soon as that hits cold water, it saturates in these metal sulfides and they deposit out on the ocean floor. Um, another type of hydrogenous sediment are evaporites. And evaporites are minerals that form when seawater evaporates, right? Comes from the name. This occurs in restricted uh, uh, kind of cutoff um, ocean areas with restricted ocean circulation, really hot and dry areas, high evaporation rates. And what will happen is as the ocean, uh, the ocean water evaporates, you'll start to precipitate out halite, which is table salt, and also gypsum. In fact, at the bottom of the Mediterranean Sea, um, there are vast deposits of gypsum and halite, which indicates in the geologic past, the Mediterranean, Mediterranean Sea has completely dried out and left behind deposits like you see here. This is a salt flat in Death Valley in California. Um, and so here, this is all white gypsum and salt and halite over a vast area. This area is really dry, so anytime it rains, all this water kind of goes out into this low-lying valley and then evaporates away. And then finally, the last type of sediment are uh, cosmogenous marine sediment. And these are derived from uh, meteor debris, okay? Microscopic iron and nickel silica spherules um, can kind of uh, come into our upper atmosphere. They get heated up and some of them melt. They turn into tectites, which are made of glass, and those can deposit out into the ocean floor. Okay, uh, They're really an insignificant proportion of marine sediment. I mean, really small amount, uh, but they can indicate uh, uh, major events, uh, perhaps uh, major collisional events that have occurred in Earth's past. Okay, so here it is. This is the sum it up kind of uh, cross section of the ocean floor showing you like different parts of the ocean. Usually when you go down and sample all the marine sediment, you usually find a mix of different types of sediment, all the different types of sediment we talked about before. Okay, um, so for example, if we're closer to land, okay, in lagoons, we would find biogenous coral, macroscopic debris, or even hydrogenous evaporites, okay, kind of like uh, landlocked areas, no ocean circulation. Here's land, here are beach deposits, here's a delta, okay. This all is considered the continental shelf. So these are shallow water neuritic sediments. So all these sediments would be derived from land eroding away and depositing very close to the land, okay. Here is the, the shelf lithogenous sediments. They're very coarse, also because they're very close to land. Remember, it's on the continental shelf. Here are those submarine canyons, and then turbidity currents under the force of gravity bring a lot of sediment down towards the abyssal plains. So here are those turbidite deposits, or submarine fans. This is the really the extent of lithogenous sediments that we would find based their origins on land. Okay, Wind-blown dust will make it out to these deep parts of the ocean, and they'll slowly settle to the bottom and become abyssal clays, fine clays, mostly made up of lithogenous sediments. Remember, all the while, micro tectites and debris, volcanic wind-blown dust can deposit in any of these environments. So there'll be a small amount in those in pelagic sediments. So once you go beyond the continental shelf, 
then you're into the deep water pelagic sediments. In deep water pelagic sediments, you'll start to see microscopic organisms depositing uh, siliceous tests or calcareous tests. Calcareous tests will not dissolve at higher elevations in the ocean above the CCD, so you'll see deposits of calcareous oozes in places like mid-ocean ridges. Okay, Then in deeper parts of the ocean where there's high productivity, you will see deposits of siliceous oozes. And that rounds up your biogenous sediments. Boom. Okay, so how is it distributed? Well, n in terms of coverage of the ocean floor, neuritic sediments only cover about one-fourth of the sea floor, meaning that the sediments that are close to land only cover about one-fourth of the sea floor. That makes sense because uh, there's a lot more open ocean than there is uh, you know, ocean surrounding land. Okay, so pelagic sediments in terms of coverage of the ocean floor cover about 75% of the ocean floor. Um, here you can see, based on the different colors, the different types of sediment, abyssal clay, calcareous oozes, diatoms, radiolarian, breaking down some of those pelagic sediments out in the open ocean. And if you see the, the continental lithogenous stuff really borders all the major land areas. You can see that there. So their distribution of those sediments are really obviously proximity to the sources of lithogenous sediments, the productivity of those marine organisms, how deep the water is, right, depending on which one of these will dissolve, and some of the seafloor features. This is um, all the major oceans. This is the pelagic sediment type for all the major ocean basins. So if we look at the North Pacific Ocean, it's mostly made up of abyssal clay, some calcareous ooze, and some siliceous oozes. The South Pacific has uh, more calcareous oozes um, and, uh, and uh, less abyssal clay. If we go to the world ocean average, this is the breakdown in pelagic sediment. Okay, and these are all the, the breakdowns of the different oceans. You know there's some differences. Siliceous oozes aren't really found in the uh, Atlantic as much as in other places. In the Southern Ocean, you find a big proportion of siliceous oozes there. Okay. Um, but a big question is, like, how do we know that seafloor sediment represents ocean surface conditions? Like, how do we know that these microscopic organisms, when they die, their shells make it to the places directly above where they lived? I mean, if clay is taking 50 years to settle through the ocean column, don't you think maybe these tests would get carried by ocean currents and brought to different areas and make it a big jumbled mess? But no, don't worry about it. Um, most biogenous tests clump together in fecal pellets that sink in 10 to 15 days. Here's a fecal pellet, guys. And this, if you cut this fecal pellet open and expose its contents, it'll be the dead remains of siliceous and calcareous organisms. And that's how they make it to the ocean floor uh, much quicker than suspension settling. Okay, if we look at worldwide marine thickness in terms of the amount of sediment that accumulates, so you can measure how much sediment has accumulated in areas, what you notice is most marine sediment uh, in terms of volume is confined closest to the continents, which makes sense because by volume, terrigenous sediment is most abundant, So, and those typically accumulate closest to their source, which are the continents. So. Here the Mississippi River really and the rivers that dump out into the Gulf dump a lot of sediment eroding from the Great Plains and the interior of the United States. Look at the other major rivers that are kind of emptying out uh, from eroded material from the Himalayas dump out into the Indian Ocean. Huge accumulations. Some of these accumulations are, if you see it's in red, that is over 20 kilometers in thickness. So 20 kilometers in thickness of sediment has accumulated on the ocean floor in some of these areas. Here's the deposits from the Orinoco River and the Amazon River. So yeah, so rivers really um, uh, distribute a lot of sediment out into the open ocean. Okay, finally, just to kind of sum this up, I know you've been with me for a long time, so let's speed this up, I guess. But you can get a lot of resources from marine sediments. Um, both mineral and organic resources are important. Uh, the problem with marine sediments is that they're not really easily accessible. No one's like, hey man, let's go out into the open ocean, 300 miles off coast. <laughs> there are a lot of uh, costs and technological challenges with 
uh, extracting those uh, resources. W one of them uh, that we do uh, go out for a lot, especially on uh, continental shelves, is petroleum. Petroleum um, accumulates. Remember we talked about diatoms? Uh, those single-celled algae that create their shells out of silica, they often create a little droplet of oil inside of their shells because it makes them more buoyant to stay in the sunlit layers of the ocean. So when they die, that droplet of oil falls down with them and all their other dying com compatriots just raining down on the ocean floor. That can accumulate um, and, and uh, create uh, petroleum that's found in the ocean. More than 30% of the world's oil comes today from offshore resources. And um, most of the land resources for oil have been found and used up or in the process of being used up. So future exploration will be intense uh, uh, in, in areas, uh, remote areas, maybe off the coast of Alaska, uh, continental shelves off uh, a lot of our different continental margins. Um, so that leads to a lot of potential for oil spills because that's happened and continues to happen. Okay, so here's an offshore drilling platform. Uh, this is what uh, is built to access those petroleum reserves that, in, that are in ocean sediment. Okay, another interesting one are uh, gas hydrates. Uh, th th these are... Um, uh, a lot of times they're, they're sediment that accumulates close to continents but at high latitudes. Um, so it's re really cold and under a lot of pressure. So that high pressure squeezes chilled water and methane gas and a lot, a lot of other gases into an ice. Um, and so the, the most common gas is methane. So there's a lot of methane trapped and a lot of marine sediment in these specific environments. Um, and when you drill them up uh, or collect that sediment, um, you can essentially, because they're made of gas, you can light them on fire. Look at these, <laughs> these guys. They've, they've, uh, they've grabbed some ocean sediment and lit it on fire. Uh, ice hydrates, because they're made of ice um, under surface conditions, like they're on this boat, they begin to volatilize and evaporate into the air. So that's why you can light it on fire. Um, so they're very unstable once you bring it on to surface conditions. Um, so uh, this, we mostly find those deposits on continental shelves. And in fact, on the seafloor, um, that methane supports a really rich community of organisms that we're just kind of understanding today. Okay. So uh, the reason why this is a potentially important resource is that we can use methane to, um, uh, to create energy, essentially. Um, the problem is uh, methane is a greenhouse gas, and the extraction methods for this ice haven't been perfected, and we don't really know how it affects the local seafloor communities that depend on that methane. Um, and so it could be a really dirty business. And um, a lot of scientists are actually worried with the warming oceans that warmer, deeper ocean waters could actually um, uh, melt a lot of these ice hydrates. Uh, and then it'll release a, a lot of methane from the ocean and into the atmosphere, which is a greenhouse gas, and then uh, kind of accelerate the global warming process. So. Um, and also, if this were, if all that methane was were to be released in one kind of catastrophic event, it could generate uh, an incredible tsunami hazard as well, because uh, it'll create an underwater slope failure. A lot of sediment will then, kind of under the force of gravity, move down towards the abyssal plain and cause a tsunami. So, those hydrates they may be the largest store of usable energy. Uh, but they rapidly decompose and they're hard to extract and we don't really know the effects of that extraction. So, uh, I mean, it, it's, it's not really um, a great resource that we could use right now. Other resources we use for motion sediment, sand and gravel. Um, we use uh, a, a lot of sand and gravel in construction practices and creating cement. Um, phosphoret deposits we use for fertilizer for plants. And so we typically find these on continental shelves 
and slopes areas of high biological activity. Um, evaporite, evaporites we use, um, you know, to season our food. Gypsum's used in drywall, so a lot of um, uh, places that were once covered by oceans, at least shallow oceans, and have since evaporated away, uh, we mine that stuff for our everyday use. Um, manganese nodules were also considered um, uh, something to be mined, although uh, it really depends on the price of those metals. Okay, uh, These nodules contain iron, copper, nickel, and cobalt, which are all economically useful metals, but the prices so far for these metals have still been uh, low, low enough to not make it really economically viable to go out into the middle of the ocean and disturb all the sediment to pick up these kind of baseball-sized manganese nodules. Um, here are the distribution of those uh, manganese nodules. Okay, um, so in some cases, in some areas, uh, interestingly enough, uh, they exceed 90%. So they're more dense areas. So there are a lot of them are found in the Pacific Ocean. All right, and then lastly, rare earth elements have become increasingly important because there are these metals uh, that are not uh, too abundant in a lot of different earth materials, um, but we use them in a lot of modern day technologies like cell phones and television screens. And the sea floor, well, the, the, the vol volcanism brings and the kind of uh, recycling of mantle material in, in mid-ocean ridges brings up a lot of uh, this material to hydrothermally circulate uh, in the, the new volcanic rocks. And they found that some of the seafloor muds have really high concentrations of rare earth elements, which, which could potentially uh, be mined out. Because as of right now, the, the biggest producer of rare earth elements for the world's use is China, and they make up about 90% of that market. So. People are definitely interested in exploring some of the ocean sediment to potentially mine uh, rare earth elements.